Hey, it's Sila Social Studies. Hey guys, welcome back to Sheila Social Studies. Today we're going to cover our fourth and final installment of the Roaring Twenties, and that's the standard of living during the 1920s. So since the turn of the century, the Ford Motor Company had been producing vehicles for Americans to purchase. Originally, they were expensive and only the few and rich can afford them. However, the car itself had an incredible effect on the economy. Roads were either non-existent or were made of dirt and full of dangerous potholes which would break the car's axles. This led to the increase of factory jobs. Employment rose as parts were needed for automobile repair and production. Also, the United States government spent millions of dollars improving roads across the nation, which allowed new business opportunities like gas stations, motels, hotels and restaurants to spring up along the roadways to service the travelers. Henry Ford dreamed of building a car that he could sell to the masses, and he did this by cutting the costs of production through mass production and the assembly line. Ford's assembly line would use a system of conveyor belts to move parts from one group of workers to another, thus saving time on production. Also, Ford was famous for saying you can have a car in any color as long as it was black. Using one color would also cut the production cost of the car. All of these measures helped Ford lower the cost of his automobile from $800 down to $300, which allowed many Americans to purchase a car. The number of registered car owners soared from 8 million in 1920 to over 20 million by 1929. The automobile changed the way Americans lived. They could now take jobs further away from where they lived and could travel more, using the newly acquired free time to give them a sense of freedom and adventure. A final way that Ford helped the American public with the purchase of an expensive product like an automobile was the incorporation of the installment plan, otherwise known as credit. Ford's customers would buy a car using an installment plan or credit. This is known as the buy now, pay later effect on the purchase of goods. The basis behind credit is that you can purchase something, take it with you, and pay it back using an installment payment plan. Americans would put little money down on the car and pay the remainder of the balance through smaller payments throughout the year or multiple years. The money borrowed would have interest or a small percentage added every month as a charge of borrowing the money. If a person defaulted on the loan or couldn't pay it back, the company would repossess or take the car back. Americans were living in the age of credit. And in the 1920s, many young Americans found a new type of independence in the changing society. As men came home from war, they moved into the cities, and for the first time in American history, more than half of the nation's population lived in urban areas. Many young people took advantage of the purchasing power of credit and the economic boom of the 1920s to gain independence in a new youth culture developed in America. The urbanization and wealth of Americans had more access to higher education. In the 1920s, high school attendance doubled and more Americans attended colleges and universities than any other time or any other country in the world. Women were also experiencing successes as the number of women in the workforce continued to grow. Women also sought new roles such as lawyers, doctors, and politicians. By the end of the 1920s, they made up 5% of the national workforce. With all of the extra time and money, many young Americans began to do a lot more in their leisure time. People were flocking to baseball games, movies, and the theater. Slapstick comedies featuring Charlie Chaplin flashed across the screens, and the first picture with sound premiered in 1927. Walt Disney introduced the world to Mickey Mouse the following year when he released Steamboat Willie. By the end of the decade, over 100 million viewers attended movie houses each week, more than the number of weekly churchgoers. New icons like baseball phenom Babe Ruth became more of a mainstream than ever. 
During the 1920s, women had finally won the war against suffrage rights when they earned the right to vote with the 19th Amendment and women began to celebrate across the nation, particularly in the Northeast. Arising in the northern part of the United States was a type of woman known as the flapper. Traditionally, women across the nation would have long hair, they would work at home, and they would wear traditionally long covering dresses. They would not engage in such activities as drinking alcohol, smoking, or the nightlife scene. During the 1920s, a generation of young women openly challenged the traditional ideas of how women were supposed to behave. Flappers were northern urban single young middle class women who normally held a steady job and were ready to party. During the day, they would work as clerks, phone operators, and department sales associates, but at night, they were ready to play. First, let's look at their style. Flappers would normally cut their hair short in a type of bob or style, at, or style it as such, and instead of long body-covering dresses, flappers wore miniskirts. They would frequently attend jazz clubs and speakeasies, illegal hidden bars because of prohibition. Flappers engaged in public smoking and the illegal consumption of alcohol. They believed if men can do it, they could do it. Young flappers ignored any traditional values. So as African Americans migrated to the north, I had mentioned before that they had migrated to the slums of New York, to a city named Harlem. Many writers and artists moved there and introduced new styles of artistic ideas, and the Harlem neighborhood became the epicenter of the Harlem Renaissance, which was a period of African American artistic and cultural accomplishments. Writers of the Harlem Renaissance made lasting contributions to American culture, and no one may have had such an impact as Langston Hughes. Hughes wrote poems, plays, and novels about African American life, and in 1930 his first novel, Not Without Laughter, won the Harmon Gold Medal for Literature. He wanted to tell the stories of African Americans' ways that reflected their actual culture. This included their love of music and laughter, but also included their suffering. Other Renaissance writers were Claude McKay, who was an activist and a poet who wrote, spoke out against racism, racial discrimination, and Zora Neale, who wrote about the experiences of the African American women. Music was another form of artistic expression that African Americans contributed to American history. During the 1920s, jazz and blues music became popular nationwide. Since jazz exploded so quickly and was so popular in the 1920s, was also nicknamed the Jazz Age. Developed in New Orleans and blending African American, European, and West African harmonies and rhythms, jazz gave young Americans something to dance to and was uh, hugely popular. Fast-paced dance crazes like the Charleston swept across the nation. Jazz musicians were innovators. They would use improvised musical solos, meaning that rarely were two musical sets the same. Two of the most famous jazz musicians were Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington. Blues music also became popular during the 1920s as well. Blues was not an upbeat as jazz. It originated in the rural south of Mississippi, using a bass that expressed the suffering of African Americans during slavery and the segregated South. Blues was predominantly played by black musicians and covered a range of emotions. Some songs were witty and satirical adaptions of life. One of the most famous blues artists of the 1920s was Mamie Smith. So let's talk about religion during the 1920s. During the 1920s, competing ideals caused conflict between Americans with traditional beliefs and those with modern views. Religious leaders were concerned about the youth culture in America like flappers and the failure of prohibition, the illegal sale, manufacture, and consumption of alcohol. The religious idea was that Americans should turn in their traditional values and the return of fundamentalism. Fundamentalism was characterized by the belief of the literal word-for-word -word interpretation of the Bible. Since the youth of America was flocking into urban areas, fundamentalism was the strongest in small towns and rural areas. Fundamentalists believe that the modern scientific theories like Darwin's theory of evolution conflicted with the teachings of the Bible and for that they opposed teaching evolution in public schools. In the 1920s, laws were passed in many states and cities that prohibited the teaching of evolution. This comes to head in 1925 with the Scopes trial. Tennessee teacher John Scopes was put on trial in 1925 for teaching evolution in school. 
Commonly known as the Scopes Monkey Trial, the court case became a literal circus. Media from around the nation flocked to Tennessee to watch the trial in person. Americans were about to find out which way the law felt about the 20s. Were the modernist youth or the traditional fundamentalist right? Ultimately, at the end of the trial, Scopes was found guilty and forced to pay a fine of $100, which is around $115 in today's inflation, for breaking the Butler Act, which forbade the teaching of evolution in public-funded schools. The state would eventually repeal the Butler Act and overturn Scopes' conviction. Many scholars argue that the result of the Scopes trial is the reason why the theory of evolution is not taught in schools today. Another competing ideal among traditionalists and modernists was the consumption of alcohol. Women fought tirelessly throughout the temperance movement, and their goals had finally been achieved with the passing of the 18th Amendment. The 18th Amendment was also called Prohibition. It outlawed the manufacture, sale, and transport of alcoholic beverages. The law was almost impossible to enforce because many young Americans would either make alcohol at home with household goods or visit speakeasies, which we will recall were illegal hidden bars. Sometimes the bar would be behind a secret door that you can only access with a secret knock. Many young Americans broke the law when it came to alcohol. Mafia bootleggers like Al Capone made millions of dollars transporting liquor in cars that they made faster with larger motors. This would allow them to outrun the police vehicles and bootlegging would ultimately lead to the creation of NASCAR. The law reduced the consumption of alcohol but ultimately failed to stop Americans from drinking. Of course, like everything else in the 1920s, prohibition was supported mostly in small rural towns and opposed the most by young urbanites in the cities. By the end of the 1920s, the nation was feeling the effects of prohibition. The government usually collected taxes on alcohol and has been losing money for a decade, and Congress believed that it would be better to have a legal alcohol trade with the government monitoring it. Prohibition ended with the passing of the 21st Amendment in 1933 with celebrations across the country. So at the end of the 1920s, there was another presidential election. In the election of 1928, Americans rode the Republican train electing businessman and philanthropist Herbert Hoover to the presidency. Americans strongly supported Hoover and hoped that he would help keep the good financial times moving. Hoover promised that he would keep economic prosperity and promised Americans a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Hoover campaigned against the Democratic governor of New York, Alfred Smith. Smith focused his issues on urban areas while ignoring the vast rural areas of America. Also, Smith was the first Catholic to run for president. The combination of these two issues was a deadly cocktail for Smith as he lost the vote to Hoover, who collected 58% of the popular vote. So the question is this, can Hoover continue America's success? Well, we shall soon see. I'll see you next time.